So can you believe it is actually New Year's Eve? The last day of 2017, it went pretty fast, didn't it? So how many of you, do you have a New Year's resolution yet? A couple of you do. Well, since we're getting to know each other a little bit better, I have a confession to make. I detest New Year's resolutions. Now, mind you, I don't have a problem with anybody else making them. But for me personally, it's a waste of time. I mean, really, the way I see it, there is no way on God's green earth that I'm going to hold to one usually attainable wish that I made up on one day with God knows what going through my mind for the 364 other days of the year. And in the same way, I'm really bad about scolding myself if I don't keep up my New Year's resolution. So I just made the decision this year that it ain't going to happen. So having said this, I do believe that God gives us each new year of our life as a reality check to see how we are living our lives. And as I look back on the year 2017, I have a question that I've been mulling over in my mind all week. Have you ever really wanted to change the world? I mean, really reach out and help heal and bring light into this darkness that seems to have permeated over the earth. You see, reality tells us that 2017 has been a hard year in this world that God once created as good. War, mass shootings, natural disasters, and famine, they are so rampant that some news that would have once, when we heard it, caused us to drop to our knees in prayer and get out and take action, now turns into yesterday's news as fast as the next horrific story pops out on Twitter. So I guess in reflecting on all this this week, I just have had this deep longing to serve as the hands of Christ to make a difference in this world some way or somehow. So as I pondered this notion this week, I kept going back to the story of the wise men and how maybe, just maybe, these wise and intelligent scholars could teach us some powerful lessons on how to t ch help change God's creation, even if it's only one gift or one person at a time. But before we go much further, we have to understand a little bit more about Jesus' mysterious visitors. And we're going to do this by playing a game. It'll also see how much you listened to the children's sermon. Now, this game I like to play is called Fact or Fiction. I'm going to read a fact about the wise men, and you have to raise your hand if you think it is fact, or you have to raise your hand if you think it is fiction. Now, there's two hints. The first one is that fiction means false. And the second one is that Na Pastor Nancy is not allowed to play, so you can't cheat off her. And Pastor Roland, the same thing goes for you. All right, so you ready? Oh, Pastor Don, yes. Hands down, hands down, cross your arms. Okay. Question one. The wise men had the status of a king. Raise your hand if you think that's a fact. Raise your hand if you think it's fiction. Okay, I have a lot of non-voters, so you better work for question two. In the Greek, the term is magi. And as Shirley told us, they were scholarly men that were skilled in the field most likely of astronomy, but some dabbled in magic. Now, the wise men worked for the king, and they worked at the king's discretion, but they were much lower in level than the king. But they would tr it is true that they would have looked to the heavens for guidance, and if they noticed something, they would have taken it as a sign and followed it. Question number two. The wise men were from Persia. Is that a fact? Raise your hand. Is it fiction? Raise your hand. You guys are, like, some of you are not voting. You have to vote on these. So it's kind of a trick question. Biblical scholars do believe that the wise men were probably from Persia, 
But if we look back at what the Bible says, it only says they came from the east, which means it could have been Persia or Mesopotamia or Babylon, and some early second century writings even list that they were from India and China. So they go back a long way. Okay, question three. Their names were Melchior, Balthazar, and Gaspar. Fact? Fiction. Ha. Huh. It's fiction. We have no clue what their names were. Now, you've heard their names, haven't you? That was because a 5th century writer made them up to go in as him. And they just have stuck as tradition. Question number four. There were three wise men. Fact? Fiction. You guys are divided almost exactly in half on this. There's no record of how many wise men there were. We say three because they presented Jesus with three gifts. So it would make sense that one person came up and presented another and another. In reality, most Eastern Christian religions believe that there were between 12 and 60 magi. The reality of three would actually be fairly rare. All right. <laughs> That's right. All right, so for our last one, this is your last one. The wise men came to the manger with the shepherds. Fact, you listen to the children's sermon. It is definitely fiction. It is believed that the shepherds arrived right after Jesus was born. However, if we look at the actual historic records of Herod, especially when Herod died, it shows that the, the wise men would have shown up when Jesus was between one and two years old. There's also a clue in the scripture where it says they came to the house, not the manger. So what does this little game teach us about the Magi? That we don't know anything about them. That's exactly right. We don't know much about them. It's the stories and the songs and all the verbal traditions that have been passed down over the years that make us think we know a whole lot more about them than we really do. But one thing we do know is that these guys were fearless. And they were fearless in what they did for Jesus. Think about it this way. They had to travel a very long way. Think if they, if they did come from China or Arabia. They saw a vision in the sky, and they put everything they had on the line to follow this vision to where it ended up over the Christ child. And that meant traveling along dangerous roads where they could have easily, because of their wealth, been robbed or killed. In the same way, they confronted Herod, who was a selfish, paranoid tyrant, and then they directly obeyed him by going home a different way in order to protect the baby Jesus. But even more than their fearless, fearlessness, the four gifts that they gave to the baby Jesus teach us more about changing the world than anything. Did I just say four gifts? I believe I did. And I'm going to tell you what they are. You know, I find it's ironic how when we read this story, we know it so well that we automatically skip forward and go straight to the gifts the, or the physical gifts, without looking at the first gift which, which the Magi gave, which is the most valuable gift of all. According to Scripture, it didn't say that the Magi came in, knelt down, and gave their gifts. It said, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Now, mind you, they never set eyes on Jesus before, but something in their hearts told them that he was the king of kings. And so before doing anything else, they fell to their knees in humbleness and humility and worshiped him. Are we ready to bow before the king and offer every single ounce of our lives to him? It's only after offering themselves to him that the men do approach and give him the gifts that they brought from their far-off lands. Now, these gifts were not just monetarily valued, but they were valued because they were known as gifts of healing in life. So the first gift they offer Jesus is gold, one of nature's most perfect substances. 
Gold not only carried great economic value, but it also helped heal the body. For taking internally, it inhibited enzymes that would break down in proteins in the body, relieve, bringing relief to aching joints. So this was a gold, was a gift that was fit for a true king. But this king would be rich in spirit and poor in wealth. The second gift that was offered was frankincense. Now frankincense is a resin that comes from a tree bark that grows only in Northeast Africa and Southern Asia and Arabia. Now frankincense was considered divine because it was a medicine that could cure anything from bad breath to lung infections. It also had great properties within it to help people who had asthma. Frankincense was also used in worship because of its amazing aroma, and they felt it was a gift from the gods or God because it had divine healing powers that were stronger than anything a human hand could ever achieve. Frankincense, it was a gift for God who came to this world in the form of a baby to bring salvation to the world. Now the third gift was, good, you got that. Biochemically similar to frankincense, in antiquity its value was a lot higher. A drop of myrrh in any type of perfume would triple the price of it because its scent was so rich. It was the ultimate medical cure for most ailments because it served as an anesthetic and it was used to promote longer life and healing without pain. Myrrh was also the greatest we know of embalming tools, but what we don't know is that it was really only used for the rich and wealthy. So to this day, myrrh was given to a poor child, a poor child who would grow into a man and whose death would serve to change the world for all eternity. So those are the four gifts given by the Magi. But now we stand in front of them, and it's our turn to offer some gifts. What do you think are some gifts that would be equivalent to today's standards of gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Well, just as the Magi offered their gifts in quiet and humble humility and worship and honor, perhaps it's our turn to do the same. And let me tell you what I mean. The first gift we might offer Jesus is the same as the wise man, to worship him in utter humility. That means not just coming to church on Sunday morning, but walking the walk and talking the talk every day of the week, to begin our days with devotion to God and pause many times to connect with Jesus throughout the day. It means giving our hearts and our souls and our minds to Jesus to use the way he wants us to use them, not the way we want to use them. When we offer ourselves to Jesus in worship and in thanksgiving, we start changing the world one heartbeat at a time because we learn that it's more important to put others before ourselves. The second gift we might offer is compassion. The world is a little short on compassion, don't you think? In fact, you have to look pretty hard to find it. What does compassion look like? Compassion means speaking to that homeless person asking them their name and giving them a buck without judging them, knowing that many of us here are just one paycheck away from being in the same position. Or it means doing random acts of kindness for strangers and not looking for glorification or to be repaid. It means treating all of God's children as equal and inviting them into our homes and our communities and most of all our places of worship. When was the last time you invited a person to worship with you out of compassion for their soul. Compassion changes this world one gesture at a time. Now the third gift we might lay at him is our name. We might lay grace at his feet. Grace treats everyone we meet like they're our best friend. Grace means looking at that overburdened weight person that you've waited 25 minutes for them to take your order and smile at them and telling them they're doing a good job. Offering grace means waiting patiently, and I'm guilty of this, behind that older adult as they walk like this 
going through the grocery store, remembering that they gave a lot of their lives so that we might live in this world the way we do. Giving grace means reconnecting with someone you've lost touch with or letting go of those little things that bug you and forgiving someone who's done you wrong. Offering grace urges us to extend our depth of caring and become attentive to a really totally new way of living and listening to people from all walks of life, not just people that are like us. Because you see, grace changes the world one soul at a time. And finally, the last gift. It's the most important of all. May we offer love. Not love like this world gives like we claim to give to each other, but the deep and unending love of Jesus. And you know what? Loving like this, it's really, really hard because the consequences that we encounter for the sake of love cost us dearly. They cost us in money. Loving like this costs us in tears, and it costs us a lot in time. Love like this is what inspired hundreds of women and men to shelter slaves in the Underground Railroad and put their lives at risk for people they didn't even know. Today, love like this might be letting our money and our time loose from our hands when we hold it so importantly and so tightly. Could you give of your time, let it go, to go read to an underprivileged child at a Title I school or go rock a baby with AIDS? Could you let go of some of that hard-earned money to help a struggling center that counsels people with drug addiction? Love like this, you guys, it's hard. And it costs us a lot. It costs us in blood and sweat and tears. But it's what Jesus wants us to do because love changes the world literally one broken person at a time because it heals them. So on this last day of 2017, the child, he's waiting for us to approach him with our gifts, not our resolutions. Each and every one of us holds in our hands and holds in our hearts the ability to go out and change this broken world one person at a time. For when we offer gold and frankincense and myrrh or compassion and grace and love and worship, we offer Jesus' healing presence to those who are in need. This is what Jesus wants from us. He doesn't want our broken promises, even though he forgives them and lets us start over. He wants our whole selves, not just on Sundays, but every day. So we're standing, friends, on the cusp of a new year. In this 2018 year of our Lord, are we ready to get down on our knees and worship and commit every ounce of our lives to live only for him so that we can change this broken world one gift in one person at a time. In the name of the greatest gift of all, Emmanuel, who is God with us, let us pray. Sweet Jesus child, each of us is standing before you with gifts to offer you. God, we feel so inadequate that nothing we give will be good enough for you. And that like many of our resolutions, we're going to fall flat in our giving. But help us to remember that with you, nothing is impossible. And all you ask of us is that we give ourselves to you in worship and humility and reflect your compassion, grace, and love to the world. For when we do this together and with you, we can change this hurting world, one gift and one person at a time. Amen.